Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Today, we're very happy to have Nadi Cyber visiting us from the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, Nadi uh, needs very little introduction, but he has worked on many different aspects of theoretical physics and quantum field theory throughout his career. And today, he's going to tell us about eminent symmetries. Thank you, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, seeing many old and new friends over the last uh, several years, partly as a result of the Simon's collaboration I am part of, I became interested in the relations between various phenomena in condensed matter physics and in high energy physics. And it turns out that we are thinking about closely related things, but from somewhat different perspectives. And I find that honestly extremely fast, really fascinating. And I think it's a good research direction because there's something the two communities can learn from the others. So part of this talk will be my attempt to bridge the gap between the two communities. And I'll be talking about a series of papers. Two of them are out. One with Mong Chen, who is a card carrying condensed matter physicist. And the other is with Zhu Heng Shao. There are two more papers in preparation. I also want to thank Tom Banks, first for participating in the early stages of this project, and also for suggesting this word. Remember, I described something to him, and I said, this is a new thing. It needs a new name. And, but I couldn't come up with any name. And that evening, I got an email from Tom. The whole email said, the word you need is eminent symmetry. And honestly, I had to look it up. And Tom was really right. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So <clears throat> going back to the top, please interrupt me with questions. I hope so far it was clear. <laughs> I guarantee you it will become less clear. So what do we do in physics? The common problem in physics to go from the UV to the IR, and throughout the talk, I'll be using this color code this purple is UV, and this is, this color would be <laughs> infrared. So if I use ultraviolet and infrared, you couldn't see them. So we formulate the problem at short distances, and this could be string theory, it could be a field theory in the UV, this could be a second form of field theory, or it could be a lattice model. And our goal is to figure out what happens at short distances. And one of the main tools we use is to use symmetries, we would like to constrain the answer using the symmetries of the problem. So we find some symmetry in the UV, we'd like to see how it is manifest in the IR. And an important part of it is that the symmetries could have a tooth anomalies, and it's known from 79 that the tooth anomalies should be matched between the UV and the IR. And a high energy physicists think about it this one way, the condensed matter physicists think about it different way to the extent that I'll do it here, I'll use the high energy perspective of anomalies where there's no bulk, no SPT, and et cetera. This is actually a property of the theory. If you didn't follow the last sentence, don't worry. So let's do a little bit of group theory. The short distance theory has a global symmetry group G and I use here this script G and that includes internal symmetry, space symmetries, et cetera. And it has a subgroup which is without a script, uh, which is defined by the fact that it does not act on the coordinates. And then by definition, that's the internal symmetry of the problem. This group, the, the translations and rotations and all that is not a subgroup of GUV, but in fact, it's a quotient of the total group by the internal symmetry group. And as such, it would be ambiguous and different people might use different definitions. It's not that I'm trying to be picky and too mathematical here. All these subtleties will be very important that we go. So the action of the coordinates, this the coordinate part of the symmetry group, depends on whether we are in the continuum or on the lattice. On the lattice, we have only lattice translation. In the continuum, we have continuum translation. On the lattice, we might have only 90 degree rotation symmetry. In the continuum, we have continuous rotation, etc. Now, we go to the IR. It is common, but not always the case, that in the IR we have a continuum theory, continuum field theory. And that might be the case 
even if at all distances we have a lattice. I emphasize parenthetically that that's not always the case. There are situations where this is very subtle, but I will not talk about it every day. So, and again, we change the color to IR. And again, we have the same story. We have total symmetry group and a subgroup, the internal symmetry group of the IR theory. So we would like to match the symmetries. That's the first thing. And then we would like to match the anomalies. So often the internal symmetry in the UV and the internal symmetry in the IR are not the same, are not the same group. However, every symmetry transformation in the UV is a good operator in the theory. It commutes with the Hamiltonian. So it's a symmetry transformation. And therefore, we have a map from the UV internal symmetry to the IR internal symmetry. Every operator here maps to an operator here. Now, that map is a homomorphism, which means that some of the symmetries in the UV might be trivial in the IR. For example, imagine the theory has a decoupled massive scalar field, complex scalar field, there's a U1 symmetry that counts the quanta, but since it is heavy, it does not appear to the low energy observer does not see that symmetry. This is a trivial example, but there could be more subtle examples where the symmetry has a, the transformation has a kernel. More interesting for our purposes are new symmetries in the IR theories. Symmetries that exist in the IR, but are not there in the UV. And they come under different names. Condensed matter physicists refer to them as emergent symmetries. The high energy physicists refer to them as accidental symmetries. For the purpose of this talk, we use them as synonymous. Although the word accidental is somewhat more appropriate because the word emergent implies that it emerges from something. And actually these symmetries do not emerge from anything. There is no sign in the UV that these symmetries should be there. So the way it happens is that we write the low energy theory. It is some field theory. And the symmetry, it should definitely have the symmetries which are in the image of GUV. But there might also be new symmetries Symmetries that are there simply because there are no operators, there are no relevant operators in the UV theory that violate them. A typical example is B minus L in the standard model of particle physics. If the standard model of particle physics, we have B minus L as a symmetry, and it's not a symmetry because there's anything sacred about that, but it is, symmetry, it's, it is an internal symmetry because all the relevant and marginal operators we can write with the field that we have happen to preserve that symmetry. Another aspect of it is that if we study the low energy theory, but not at extremely low energy, but it's slightly higher energy, we realize that the symmetry is only approximate because if you go to very high energies, the symmetry is not there. And in fact, all the, when people look for proton decay or neutrino masses, what they do is they go after the coefficient, try to measure the coefficient of an irrelevant operator that violates the symmetry. So this symmetry is kind of an accident referred to as emergent symmetry. And it is, there's no sign of it in UV. And therefore, if we try to say match anomalies or anything, these symmetries should not match anything in the UV because the symmetry is not there. So before we get into anomalies, the symmetry should be. That's not the full story. And there are eminent symmetries. I'll use this green, I hope it's visible. These are symmetries that emanate from the UV space symmetries, but they act as internal symmetries in the IR. For example, UV translations can lead to internal symmetry. And these symmetries are really different from emergent symmetries. In the literature, people discuss them to some extent, and they refer to them as emergent symmetries, but they have fundamentally different properties. For example, they can exist relevant operators violating the eminent symmetry, but they are not present in the low energy effective theory. So the low energy observer says we have this symmetry. It could be violated by some relevant operators, but it's not. So there are relevant operators that could violate it, but these operators are not present in the IR theory. And so that looks like fine tuning, but more interestingly, there aren't even irrelevant operators that violate. So if we go a little bit higher up in energy, and explore the irrelevant operators in the low energy theory, even these operators do not violate the eminent symmetry. 
I'm so these about these points here. So the, there are, can be relevant operators violating uh, the eminent symmetries. Those are operators in which theory? In the low energy, I'm a low energy observer. I see an operator that violates a relevant operator that violates the symmetry, but this operator is not in the action. Okay. So the low energy observer says this looks like an exact symmetry at short distances. In fact, if we even if we explore the irrelevant operators. These op these operate they are irrelevant operators that violate the symmetry, an infinite number of them, but they are not present in the effective action. So it's not the absence of operators that violate the symmetry, it's just the their all their coefficients are zero in the exactly, exactly. So these operators exist as operators, you can compute their correlation functions, but would try and add them by hand to the action. But if you come from the UV, they are not there. It looks like an infinite amount of fine-tuning. I should say that. The way I phrase it here, it sounds almost impossible. How can this possibly be the case? By the end of the talk, you would say, yeah, we knew it all along. <laughs> and you will be right thinking that it's impossible that you will be right that you knew it all along. Is it, it was a fair question. Right. This, is, this goes kind of against the philosophy of effective field theory. No, it's not. No, the way I phrased it here, it looks like it is against this thing, but that's why it deserves a different name. It's against if you think of it as an emergence symmetry. But it's not an emergent symmetry, it's a different phenomenon. So I'll, I'll give examples of that. So is, is the lattice important for this? No. I, or depending you on how much time I have, the Yeah, so I, the, my first examples will involve lattice. And depending how much time I have, I'll exhibit an example in the continuum, which exhibits the same thing. This is not because we have a lattice. There was a question here. I was just going to ask if umclap is an example. That's right. Umclap is precisely an example of that. Then we didn't know it. Well, Sorry? Then we did know it all along. Yes, but you didn't phrase it that way. We did not get the, the consequences of this fact. Only. And the one form, emergent one form symmetry? Okay, okay. emergent one form symmetry is almost like that because there are no local operators that violate it, but it doesn't emanate from anything. And therefore, I, I do not know whether it deserves the name eminent or not. But it does have this property. Yeah, then, but you see, when the one form symmetry, there is no local operator That's that why violates I mean, it. Yeah. And therefore, it's a different thing. Yeah. This thing is a different beast. Okay. And Umklap is precisely an example of that, but I'm confident that it was not phrased that way. And I, I checked that with a large number of people, including people in the audience. So the low energy, the eminent symmetries are exact in the low energy theory. They behave as if this is an exact symmetry, even though it does not exist as a symmetry in the UV. Right, the symmetry group as a group is not a subgroup of the UV symmetry. And we can have an anomaly matching for it. I do not know whether I have enough time to discuss it. I'll show some examples how the symmetries of the eminent, the anomalies in the eminent symmetry appear in the in, in the UV, in both in the UV and the IR and how they match. So in this talk, I'll give a bunch of examples. And I declare that this is old wine in a new bottle. Old wine because you knew it all along in a new bottle. Let's hope the bottle is, is transparent enough that it does not obscure the physics. So these are the examples that we'll discuss here. The Majorana chain, the one plus one D lattice icing model. These two models were studied by, have been studied by hundreds of thousands of papers and I'm not exaggerating. I think that's the right order of magnitude. It's hard to imagine you can say anything new about them. And then I'll give it, present an example in the continuum to address your question. Any one plus one dimensional system with a global U1 symmetry with a chemical potential is an eminent symmetry. And then I'll go to the Heisenberg chain and depend how much time I'll, I'll go with it. I'll, I might skip some of these. And there are also many other examples and I'm writing no papers about other examples. So let's go to work. The uh, talk finally begins. We'll start with the Majorana chain. This is exactly solvable system, except although otherwise it would not be necessarily solvable. We have a lattice with L sites and periodic boundary conditions. So if I shift the index by A, it's the same fermion. And they satisfy Clifford algebra at the site. So I have real fermions at every site. And I impose two symmetry transformations one, translation. And know the color coding, this is this purple for UV, which shifts the index by one and using the periodic boundary conditions to come back. And I'm also using fermion parity 
that flips the sign of the front view. You can write a Hamiltonian. The reason I will class will soon be clear. This is an example of a Hamiltonian nearest neighbor interaction, the nearest neighbor coupling between the fermions. So that's an example of a, a Hamiltonian that preserves these two couplings. But I can, for the purpose of this talk, I can add here next to nearest neighbors and four Fermi interaction. And then the model is no longer solvable, but everything I will be saying will still be correct. So think of this as an example, but I'll be talking about a much larger class of plots. Now we can also add a fermion parity defect or equivalently take the same Hamiltonian and impose anti-periodic boundary conditions, which means that there's a minus sign here. So instead of doing that, I can consider this Hamiltonian. And again, I can add four Fermi interactions, six Fermi interaction, no seven Fermi interactions because this violates this symmetry, but everything will be written as a sum of terms so that it is invariant under translation. And as I said, for most of our discussions, it doesn't matter what the Hamiltonian is, it's just whether we are in the plus or minus. And altogether, <coughs> you can think of H plus as having any Hamiltonian with periodic boundary condition, and H minus is the same Hamiltonian with anti-periodic boundary conditions. And if it starts appearing to you like it's similar to what we do in the continuum, where we have it never Schwartz or Ramon, that's not a coincidence. This this will have something to do with Ramon, and this will be, have something to do with Neve Schwartz, but we would like to see the left movers and the right movers, et cetera. So this is what we'll be studying, studying. And altogether, we'll study four different models, either H plus or H minus, and the number of sites being even or odd. So to tell you a little bit ahead, N even with H minus will be the Neve Schwartz, Neve Schwartz theory. And L even with H plus would be the Ramon Ramon theory. H minus with L odd is the Ramon Neve Schwartz, and the other is Ramon Neve Schwartz. Now I should add that odd L is notoriously confusing. The prevailing view in the literature is to stay away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll have more to say about that later. Usually, I gave this talk a number of times, and at this point, somebody always said, but we know that this theory with the odd L is inconsistent. And I have to say, wait a minute, we'll get there. So let's discuss the even L theory. We have two symmetries. I'll do simultaneously the plus and minus in the periodic or anti-periodic. We have two symmetry transformations, T plus and T minus. These are different symmetry transformations in different theories. So it's T plus in the plus theory and T minus in the minus theory. And we have fermion parity. And we can redefine the phases such that T minus to the L is minus one to the F. That is the statement that as we go all the way around the chain, this is T to the L, we go all the way around the chain, we get a minus sign on fermion and plus sign on boson. This is the statement of anti-periodic boundary conditions. And translation commutes with minus one to the F. That looks, yeah. Uh, these symmetries, they do not depend on whether there are even or odd number of fermions in the side. In the it, it does depend, but at the moment I'm with L even. Oh, sorry. At the moment L is even, we'll get to L odd. And then you will see that whatever I said here should be re-examined. H plus is a little bit more interesting. We don't have minus one to the F because we have periodic boundary conditions. So T plus to the L is one. However, we have an interesting minus sign here. Translation in minus one to the F do not commute. The easiest way to see that is that the operator that generates minus one to the F is a product of all the fermions in the problem. And if we apply translation, we change all the labels and we have to take the last one and bring it back to the beginning is an even number of fermions. So there's an odd number of transpositions giving a minus sign. Now, if you're a high energy physicist and you see a minus sign here, the first thing you should scream, that's an anomaly. Why do we have a minus sign here? How come translation anti-commute with minus one to the F rather than commutes? So that's an anomaly. And that's an anomaly between fermion parity and translation. And it immediately raises a question because soon we'll discuss the continuum theory and we'll have to do anomaly matching. So this minus sign should also appear in the continuum theory. But in the continuum, it's well known that there's no anomaly involving translation. 
right? In the continuum, there's no anomaly involving the translation. So how can we possibly match this minus this anomaly on the lattice with an anomaly in the continuum? So that's the first question, and I'm going to answer this question. In order to answer this question, let's diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And again, many people have done it. So we'll focus on the simple quadratic Hamiltonian, but the same discussion applies to uh, with more work to more subtle Hamiltonian. So that's quadratic. We go to momentum space. This is a problem in the quantum field theory 101. The different momentum modes uh, decouple. And we got a Fermi uh, dispersion relation that looks like that. With H plus, we have two zero modes, one with zero momentum and the other with L over two. And with L minus, H, we have a similar spectrum, but there's, there are no zero modes. That's straightforward to see from the Hamiltonian. And now we are at low energies. So we are not interested in what happens at high energies. So we kind of cut that part of the spectrum off. And then we see a linear dispersion relation here and the linear dispersion relation here and similarly here. So we interpret the modes coming here as having positive momentum and they are right movers. And for the guys around here, we take the, we take, we, we measure the momentum from the left. So these are left movers and we get left movers and right movers from the two ends of the spectrum. And it's easy to see then that H plus leaves at low energies gives us the spectrum of the ramon ramon theory and H minus gives us the spectrum of the Nevis-Schwartz-Nevis-Schwartz theory. And there are many examples in high energy physics and in condensed matter physics that lead to such a two ends of the spectrum, like Fermi surface in, in case of a in one plus one dimensional, fermions, et cetera. Somebody raise his hand here or her hand. What do you mean labels? This L over two, do you mean like pi or? Well, they, this is the one that you would call pi in some other units. I'm, for me, k is always an integer. And oh. therefore, therefore, this is the thing that you would otherwise call. So the, the thing in the phase is k over a. It, sorry, yeah. It's e to the i k little l over big l. This is half the Brillouin. This is the other end of the Brillouin zone. So if you just put that in momentum space and pick your normalization of k, you will get something like this. Now, what are the symmetries? On the lattice, we have only minus one to the F, but we don't have minus one to the F left and minus one to the F right. Separately, we only have their product. And that immediately raises a question. Why is this model gapless? Why is this model massless? After all, if I'm a continuum person, I can add a mass term. And the mass term in the continuum does not violate minus one to the F. It violates minus one to the F left and minus one to the F right, but it doesn't violate minus one to the F. So there is a relevant operator, so uh, dimension a half a half in the continuum that I could have added and I cannot edit. In fact, this theory is gapless without any fine tuning. In fact, I can add an operator with three left movers and three right movers, which is also invariant, it's irrelevant, it's also invariant at the minus one to the F, but this one also is absent at low energies. So we see that we get some exact symmetry at low energies for free. An exact symmetry, which is not there in the UV. Now, <clears throat> let's examine the algebra in more detail. Oh, I should say before that, I'm giving you a tip of where, what the answer would be. This question by the color, <laughs> the answer would be that this is an eminent symmetry that does the job. In fact, it wasn't clear without the color, the color gave it. <laughs> let's examine it in more detail. On the lattice, we don't have minus one to the F left. So let's consider the black theory. We had that symmetry algebra. And in the IR, this, this internal symmetry emanates from T plus. And the key point is we can write a formula like that. T plus, it's the lattice translation, is given by an internal symmetry times a continuum symmetry. So how should we think of this, this equation? The lattice person, the UV person, has one translation operator. The IR person says that T plus is a product of two factors. One of them is either plus one or minus one, telling us whether we are at this end of the spectrum or the that end of the spectrum. So at this end of the spectrum, this factor is plus one. At this end of the spectrum, 
this factor is minus one, related to uh, Michael's question that this is what somebody else would call pi. And what the continuum person calls momentum, it's P plus because we are in the plus theory, not because of the direction. This P is positive here and negative here. So these guys are right moving and these guys are left moving. This is all very well known. So P plus is the continuum momentum. And on the lattice, we have only T plus, but on the, in the continuum, we have two symmetries. This is an internal symmetry. And this is the continuum translation. On the lattice, only the left-hand side is well-defined. At low energies, each factor by itself is well-defined. <laughs> and if, as long as we are sufficiently low here, we are not going to be confused of whether we could, we, it's clear whether we should call it minus one to the F left, meaning plus one here and minus one here, but this is ambiguous for high energy modes. So for high energy modes, this separation is not meaningful, but at low energies, it is meaningful. When you say minus one to the FL is a exact symmetry, can you clarify what, you're, what you mean by exact symmetry? In the sense that the low energy observer sees someone, these, sorry? Someone who truncates just to the relative, to the leading action in the infrared? No, it's exact, even, even for high dimension operators, provided you are at energy, you are at energies sufficiently below the cutoff. So as long as I'm sufficiently below the cutoff, I'll say more about that. The question you're asking is, what's the process that, vi that detects that the symmetry is not exact? Is that <coughs> the question? I, I want to work with finite but large L and look at low energies. That's the experiment. I'm not saying I'm taking any limit. So I mean, finite, large, but finite L. If I take L to infinity, the symmetry is exact. This, this is obvious. At finite L, the symmetry is not exact, but it is as if it's exact for low energy processes. The only process that violates it is somebody here, I think you asked, it's the Umklap process. I'll get to that. Furthermore, this relation, which is a relation between the lattice operator and what, how the continuum person described it, is actually an exact relation. This is very rare because usually when you relate the lattice operator to the continuum operator, they are one over L square corrections. I order in L. But if imagine this correct this equation had a one over L correction, say in the exponent here. So instead of P, there would be a one over L square in the exponent. This would mess up this relation. So therefore, there is no way to write any correction to this equation. This equation is, is exact. And that's another sign that what we're doing here is is to see an exact symmetry. Now, in the continuum, this is an internal symmetry. This is an internal symmetry. And it's easy to check that in the Ramon, Ramon theory, minus one to the F and minus one to the F left anti-commute. So in the continuum, minus one to the F and minus one to the F left anti-commute, they do not commute. <laughs> Therefore, the ground state is, the ground state is a doubly degenerate. So we get a minus sign here. So in the continuum, we have an anomaly between two internal symmetries. And now we'll interpret this anomaly as the continuum descendant of the anomaly we had in the, on the lattice between lattice translations and minus one to the if. So on the lattice, this, was, this came from lattice translation and it was a minus sign. In the continuum, such a minus sign, such an anomaly cannot appear from translation because there's no anomaly involved in translation. However, the translation operator gives out, so that part doesn't have an anomaly, but that part, this eminent symmetry, can have an anomaly, and in fact, it matches. Now, we can repeat this thing also for the antiperiodic one, and then this is the algebra, and again, we get in eminent symmetry. So now let me make a few more comments about that. The minus one to the F left symmetry in the continuum is exact. It's not an emergent symmetry. I mentioned specifically uh, operators that violate it, but are not present in the action. It emanates from lattice translation. And it answers the two questions I asked earlier. Why did we land on the massless theory? We landed on the massless theory because 
the operator that gives rise to the mass term in the continuum violates lattice translation. It preserves lattice translation by two units, but does not preserve lattice translation by one unit. So the UV way of saying it is that the mass, is, the mass term is absent, not because there is no such operator, but because this operator is odd under lattice translation. It is even under continuum translation, but recall that continuum translation and <laughs> translation are not the same operator. They differ by this factor of minus one to the F left. And indeed the, minus, the mass term is odd under minus one to the F left. So it explains this puzzle of how we landed on a massless theory without fine tuning. So if you wish lattice, making sure that the lattice theory is invariant and the lattice translation guarantees that we, we have massless fermions when the model is gapless at long distances. And I also emphasize that the anomaly, the UV anomaly between lattice translation and minus one to the F is matched in the IR with minus one to the F, I mean, an anomaly between minus one to the F and minus one to the F left. So this thing really works very well. And we see in what sense this symmetry is different than the emergent symmetry. And we see how we resolve all the puzzles. Now, let me make some comments about odd L. So now we have an odd number of fermion. But before you do that, can, can I ask again, this, this relationship T plus is minus one to the F left times the continuum translation. That's not an exact relationship on the entire Hilbert space. Right? That's correct. So how can it be that- it, No, it, it is exact in the sense I can assign, but it's ambiguous. It's minus one to the F left and e to the I P yeah. e to the I P plus I not, factors that can move back. They're, they're not separately system. defined that's that, on, that's on the entire Hilbert space. That's correct. But there is a subspace on which they are separately defined. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly and right. And that subspace can be defined even in the UV without, the, without taking the low energy limit. Uh, yeah, no, but only by taking the low energy. I mean, it's not a limit. It's not so a limit. Finite L energy is below something. So let me tell you how it would be violated. So L is large, 100, if you don't like it, take 1,000. And you ask yourself, and you put some states which have low momentum, momentum zero, one, in the units where momentum is quantized, not in the units that Michael prefers. So for me, K is an, is an integer or half integer, depending on the boundary conditions. And you have any number of operators with low momentum, momentum of order one, as long as no momentum is of order L, or L over two to be precise, and the number of insertions is not of order L over two, the symmetry is exact. Because the symmetry can be violated only by L over two units. And as long as you don't have enough quanta to create violation by L over two units, the symmetry appears to be exact. This is unlike, although this is known, it, it's, it's important to emphasize this is unlike what we normally have. Now, where do we have an example of this process that violates the momentum by L over two units? This is the umkla. So you can ask fewer in the, uh, in the continuum. There's a lattice at short distances. How would you tell that at short distances we have a lattice rather than the continuum? You can do scattering with low momentum all day. You will never be able to tell. The only way to tell is to have a process that tells you that momentum is conserved modulo A rather than conserve period. And that's the process of UMCLA with all its understanding in condensed matter physics. But from the hand, from the no energy effective point, field theory point of view, it's an exact symmetry. So if, if, uh, if we have a interacting theory, is that becomes uh, approximate up to exponential? No, correction? no, no it's, it's actually exact even when you add interactions. Because if you work in coordinate space, it looks like it's approximate up to exponential corrections. But if you work in momentum space and you consider correlation functions of a finite number of operators with finite momentum and take L to be sufficiently big, then it's, it's a, it is exact. Because the mixture of state into your state in the Hilbert doesn't matter. I'm diagonalizing the, I'm diagonalizing the conserved charge. I'm a low energy person, it's okay. In condensed matter language, you would say, as long as you don't have the umkla process, the symmetry is exact. And I'm going to say the same thing. And the umkla process involves uh, changing momentum, seeing momentum 
violation, momentum conservation, violation of momentum conservation by L units. So it, or L over two. So until you have that, right, you need to hop from one side of the, you have to hop along the Brillouin zone. So as long as you don't do that, and you look at correlation functions in momentum space of finite number of operators with finite momentum. So finite number of operators, finite momentum each, and keep L sufficiently big but finite, the symmetry is exact. You will see no sign that the symmetry is not there. And part of the point is that the, the IR theory is determined specifically by that subspace that you just said. So that, that's why the IR theory doesn't see the, the that's violation. Right. That's right. Because it has low momentum. May I ask a question about notation? So in what sense this is an anomaly? Then uh, That's not an anomaly. This equation is not an anomaly. This sign is an anomaly. Yeah, the, the, both cannot be imposed simultaneously, but... Uh, no, 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 no. With, uh, every equation of this slide is correct. So what cannot be imposed simultaneously is getting a plus here. Right. So minus one to the F and minus one to the F left, which started its life as translation, they do not commute. And the reason they don't commute is not because of this factor, but because of that factor. Because there's a general principle that tells you that this factor will always commute. This is the, this is what the low energy observer calls translation. Just to make sure that I'm understanding right, that factorization minus one to the FL exponential, this is right all the time up to the point exactly at the top of the spectrum. Well, that's a way of saying it. Mm -hmm. okay. I can also say that I can define it at the top anywhere I want. I can define it all the way from here to here by saying that the momentum oh, here okay. is larger than L over two mm -hmm. uh, and say that it's the analytical continuation of this branch. But as long as you do not discuss what's going on here at the top, I don't, you, there's a natural choice. So on the lattice, it's a, the, this decomposition is ambiguous. But, but it's it ambiguous at one, one single point at most, right? That's a, at least. I would say it's at least at one point, but I would say better than that. It's, it's ambiguous in the whole range here, but I'm not going to look at that range because I'm only going to look at processes with low movement, momentum of order. So the way to think about it, fix the momentum, one, seven, 50, et cetera, and make L sufficiently big, a million, and stop. Don't take L to infinity. Then the, this would be exact. So this brings me to odd L, with the problem which is notoriously confusing. And so what are we going to do about it? The problem is that we have a Clifford algebra with odd number of elements, and the Clifford algebra with an odd number of elements doesn't have minus one to the F as an operator. It's an automorphism of the algebra, but it's not in, in O. So what do we do about that? The common point of view in the literature is to ignore the problem, say it's inconsistent and forget about it. That's not what I'm going to do here. And the first thing I would do in my defense for not doing it is that this is not what Clifford did. When Clifford faced an odd number of fermions, Mr. Clifford said, well, we can realize that. And when Pauli had to realize three objects satisfying the Clifford algebra of three elements, Pauli discussed the Pauli matrices. It's a two-dimensional representation. There's nothing wrong with that. So the question is whether we can actually do field theory with this representation. So that as we do it, we, whatever we do, something we'll have to give. So one option is to take canonical quantization. And that's the one that I will do here. I'll give up on minus one to the F and therefore the Hilbert space will not be graded. That's the approach I will take here. I would also take the other approach, which is also common, is to add a decoupled fermion. Now the number of fermions is even, and now I don't have this problem, and I can define minus one to the F, and the Hilbert space is graded. But either way, when we try to take tensor products of such factors, it becomes a little bit confusing because here we don't have minus one to the F, so how can we have minus one to the F in the product? And here, the number of fermions keeps growing, and we add the coupled fermions, that's not the right answer. So that's, these are the options with canonical quantization, Alternatively, we can assume that tensor product is okay, it's the standard way, and use a path integral to define the problem. So we take this problem with an odd number of fermions, we square it. Now we have no problem, we evaluate the path integral, and then we take the square root of the path integral, and we end up with something that does not have a Hilbert space interpretation. So trace of one is 
trace of one is square root of two. So we can, for the rest of the talk, I can follow any one of these approaches. Every one of them is something funny about it, but specifically I will follow this approach. Okay, so now I can go fast because it's exactly the same story as before. I'm going to take an irreducible representation of the Klingon algebra. Now I don't have minus one to the F. I don't have minus one to the F left. I don't have minus one to the F right. So before we had this factor, but we didn't have these two separate factors. Now I have none of them, right? There's no operator in the Hilbert space that satisfies these rules. And again, at least in this case, I can just diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And I find that T plus minus to the L power is a phase. And I'm not going to explain how we determine the phase, but the fact that there's a one over 16 here seems promising. I'll soon relate it to things that you know. So what does it look like? Depending on whether we do H plus or H minus, namely this Fermi on the periodic or under periodic, you can still go to Mobenum space and find this dispersion relation. And the only subtlety is with the zero mode, all the non-zero modes appear. So all the non-zero modes appear with two of them. So it's easy to find the realization of them. The problem is that the zero mode is unique. There's a unique zero mode. And it is either with momentum zero or with momentum L over two. And we need to decide what to do about that. But before we do that, we again see right movers and left movers. It's the same story as before. We look only at what happens at low energies. And we see right movers here and left movers here. The right movers here have a zero mode. They have a single zero mode. The left movers from here do not have a zero mode. And with H minus, it's the other way around. <laughs> so it's straightforward to see that H plus leads to the Neve Schwartz Ramon theory, and H minus leads to the Ramon Neve Schwartz. Now, if you don't like my interpretation of what I do with an odd number of fermions, you should really go and check what you really mean by the Neve Schwartz Ramon or the Ramon Neve Schwartz. When you quantize this system, there's also a single zero mode, not two, one fermion zero mode, which is either coming from the left movers or from the right movers. And there's a question how to quantize it. And the approach I took here was to say that that zero mode is quantized to be one or is minus one. So it's like, I do not have good grading because of that. So now I can just copy and paste from the previous slide. We don't have these symmetries, but in the infrared, we have minus one to the F left that emanates from T plus. So we get this algebra. So this is the UV algebra. And when we go to the infrared, the spectrum breaks into the part from the left and the part from the right in this form. It's a product of two factors. And indeed in the continuum, we have this relation that when we, do it, when we do complete rotation of space, we get minus one to the F left because the left movies are in Neve Schwartz and an anomalous factor, which reflects the ground state momentum. And on the lattice, only T plus makes sense, but you see that these equations together make sense. So P plus is again, the momentum of the continuum theory. On the lattice, only T plus is well-defined. But in the continuum, the two factors are separately meaningful and are exact symmetries. And again, this relation between the lattice and the continuum is an exact relation without finite L correction. And we can repeat the same thing for H minus. And you have to flip some signs here, but it's basically the same story. That's what I wanted to say about the Majorana chain. And now I'm moving to an even older problem. We would like to take the Majorana chain and convert it to the item model. Ask him. Yes. Would you say a bit about like edge modes or like? I have closed chain, so there are no edge modes. It's not the same as the Kitayev chain. I have periodic. I, see. I have periodic boundary conditions. I can give another talk, but what happens if I have a finite chain and what boundary conditions I put and so forth? That's not in this talk. Could you tell us how to make minus one to the F left not emanate? What do we have to do to the UV to make us not get that? Symmetry? I don't think you could do that. Not do that. Yeah, I think you cannot do that. So you want it to be an internal symmetry in the UV. That's well, you might be able to do that, but it's a lot trickier. Here it just came, you know. Yeah, I, no, I, I, but I, and it's good that it came because it's, it came in exactly the way you need it in order to make sense. So this whole story about the Majorana chain giving us critical point and the master and violation UV translation, all that was known at least from the 70s, if not earlier. 
but this way of packaging it is new. What does all this have to do with the icing model? So we know how to go. So this again, huge literature about, about this problem. And I'll follow here the high energy physicist way of doing it, which is a little bit different than the condensed matter way of doing it. I'll give some references. So the high energy physicist will tell you, oh, all we need to do is perform GSO projection on this fermionic chain. So we have a fermionic theory. We need to perform the GSO projection, except that we are on the lattice. So again, finite L, finite lattice. So what we're going to do is to double the Hilbert space, have a direct sum, take the previous problem here and take another copy of it here. And on this doubled Hilbert space, this is the analog of adding the periodic and the anti-periodic boundary. I'm writing the following Hamilton, H minus in the upper block and H plus in the lower block. So this is the problem we have. H plus is any problem with periodic boundary conditions and H minus is the same one with anti-periodic Can I just double check on it? So in the L even, uh, the H plus led to the eminent symmetry. And the H, H minus, minus did also. it also have? Yep. Because I thought that one didn't have an anomaly to begin with. That's right, but the symmetry was there. Didn't so have an anomaly. It wasn't an in exact U symmetry then? It didn't have in the anomaly in the UB. It didn't have the anomaly in the IR, so it matched. I'm happy to go back to the slide. The same thing, the spectrum had two pieces. One piece came from here and one piece came from there. So minus one to the F left was one on these guys and minus one. It's the same, okay. the same thing. The anomaly could not be satisfied otherwise, but the eminent symmetry could also be there if there's no anomaly in action, and which is common with anomalies. So, and we have translation in this big Hilbert space because we have separate translations for the anti-periodic fermions and separate translation for the periodic fermions. So these are the symmetries of this problem. In addition, since we double the Hilbert space, we also have another, what's called quantum Z2 symmetry. This is a terrible name, but this is a common name in the literature. When we have these two sectors, we can have a symmetry that signs plus one to these guys and minus one to these. And all these operators have tildes on top of them because they act in the big Hilbert space H tilde. So now let's separate L even and L odd. So some operators in the double Hilbert space are non-local. And so what are we going to do about that? We just do what's doing down in the continuum. We have to perform a projection. We know exactly which projection to perform. So we project on this minus on A dot tilde times minus one to the F. And as we do that, we land on the icing bar. This is the standard, this is just imitating what is being done uh, in the continuum. However, there are some interesting uh, subtleties here. First, we can use jordan wigner transformation and exactly rewrite the Hilbert space, exactly rewrite the Hamiltonian using X and C, these are Pauli matrices of the sites. But notice that the number of sites is half what it was before because we grouped the fermions into pairs in order to have these uh, sigma matrices active on them. So we group them into pairs, and this is an exact change of variables. And this is something if L is small, you can actually do it very, very explicitly by hand with one, two, three, four, say there are four sides, and then M would be two. This would be the icing model on two sides, otherwise it's getting more messy. And the important thing is that there are half as many sides. And we can also project with the other sign, and that leads to the icing model with a Z2 defect. So I put one sign here in the icing model. Okay, let's discuss the symmetries in a little bit more detail. We had this anomaly before, only in the plus sector, only for the Ramon remote, but not for the Nevis Woods, Nevis Woods. So T plus is the operator that moves the fermions by one side. Uh, so T is the operator that moves the fermion by one side. With a plus sign for the periodic fermion, it anti-commutes with minus one to the F. So if we try to project on some value of minus one to the F, we have an anomaly. And the anomaly prevents T plus from being a symmetry. It is as if we there was a mixed anomaly between this and that. And if we project on this, we, which means that we kind of gauge that one, we broke that symmetry. That's the standard. So, T tilde 
is a symmetry in the big Hilbert space, commutes with the big Hamiltonian, but it does not act in the smaller Hilbert space after the projection. No, it's not a symmetry. So what are the symmetries? First, we can take it square. We take it square, the anomaly drops out, and these two things act in the big Hilbert space, and they also act in the projected Hilbert space. So I'm going to drop the tilde and define T icing as T tilde square projected and eta, which is the Z2 symmetry of icing projected. Notice that since we took a square here, this is an operator whose nth power is one, not its lth power. It's like two translations of the fermion, which translates to, translates is not a good word here, which becomes translation by two sides. Translation by two sides of the fermion is translation by one side for the boson, because we group them in two pairs. So this is the traditional picture of icing. We have a chain, icing chain, with n sides. The icing to the n is one, and eta, eta square is one. That's the Z2 symmetry of IC. What happened to the translation that we lost? Our system was very special. It had another translation symmetry and we lost it. Well, in the 21st century, every time you lose a symmetry, you know what to do. It would come out somewhere, perhaps as a non-invertible symmetry and that's indeed the case here. So the translation that we lost will soon come as a non-invertible symmetry. And again, I emphasize my mean finite L. So L is finite. In this case, I could do it with eight sides. And what I'm saying is still correct. So this is the traditional symmetry. What do we have with a translation? Before we had T plus here in the two, two block, and it didn't commute with minus one to the F. So when we perform the projection, we messed it up. Now we say, okay, let's put zero here. Now it commutes with, still commutes with the Hamiltonian, and it also commutes with the projection because we had the problem here. <clears throat> the problem with putting zero here is that now this translation operator is not unitary because we have a zero in the two, two block. Okay, it is what it is. It commutes with the Hamiltonian, it commutes with the projection, so we can project it to the small Hilbert space and will be noted by D, D because it has something to do with duality. In fact, let's see why it has something to do with duality. T minus is the operator that translates the fermion by one side, and it becomes in the infrared, it becomes minus one to the F left. And minus one to the F left of the fermion is closely related to Kremervenia duality in the bosonic language. But if you don't want to discuss the infrared at all, just say on the lattice, we have this symmetry can be written in terms of the XIs and the ZIs, et cetera. We can project it. And it is mathematically, it's known as a partial isometry. Here is the definition. It's a unitary symmetry on the orthogonal complement of its kernel. So there's a kernel because of the zero here. And we have a unitary transformation here on the complement. And it satisfies the following algebra on the lattice. So, if we, so this is something that we can write very explicitly in, term, in terms of the X and Zs and Ys on the lattice. And if you don't believe, you just as if, think of it as if we pulled it out of the head. But in fact, it came from lattice translation, but only for the anti-periodic ones, not for the periodic one. So the way it acts is that if we square it, we find, so if we square it, we get T squared. This is like I say, but I say only with that part of the Hilbert space, not with that one. So we have a projection operator here. So the algebra it satisfies the D square to lattice translation, lattice translation of the IC one. So various people mentioned related things, saying the duality, you open it, see, duality is half translation, or duality is translation by half a site, or duality maps you from the sites to the links. There are various ways of saying it. As far as we could tell, this was never written as an operator acting on that Hilbert space rather than an operator that maps one Hilbert space to another. But whatever way you come from, there's a very explicit formula for D. Forget where it came from. You can check that it commutes with the Hamiltonian. It acts within the same Hilbert space. It satisfies these algebra. So as I said, we can express it in terms of coordinates and check it explicitly. 
so in, in this uh, class expression, if you have defined like a D tilde, such that D tilde square is one minus eta T eisen, there's no such thing. Not be a there's no such thing. System. That's not a symmetry of the system. And the, the reasons are really the UV, why it's not a symmetry. Well, it's only UV. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, yeah. I'm talking here about the UV. I have a lattice. This is a property of a lattice with an even number of sides at LB4. So it's slightly non trivial, and everything I say here is correct. There's no symmetry with a minus. There is another one that gives inverse here. If you started with T minus inverse, that would give a minus sign here. Inverse minus. That's another one that you have. So it mixes the non invertible symmetry, mixes with lattice translation. So this symmetry actually flows at long distances to the non invertible symmetry of the continuum IC model that some people here in the audience worked on, and I think these are the original references. And as in the previous case, we could write an exact formula relating a lattice operator to the continuum model. So a continuum person would say there's momentum P, and there's continuum D, and the lattice D is related to them using this formula. The one over root two is because of the normalization I used here. And the continuum non-invertible symmetry satisfies this algebra. Notice that there's no translation here. Right. This continuum translation is here, set the periodic boundary conditions, and the continuum D commutes with eta is equal to D, and eta square is that, and D square is one plus eta. But on the lattice, we had a different algebra. The lattice, we have mixed translations and the non-invertible symmetry mix. Can I ask about the normalization? So it, in the continuum, at least, uh, topological operators have preferred normalizations because if you put them in a long time, you have to get consistent Hilbert spaces. Yeah. The same true. The same is true there. And yeah. then the purple D is. Bo both normalizations are natural for different purposes. Okay. It will become clear on the next slide. Okay. So again, D is an eminent non invertible symmetry. It is exact in the. It is exact in the IR effective theory, not violated even by irrelevant operators. But on the lattice, both of these symmetries are exact. Let me go briefly through odd L. <clears throat> in this case, there is no minus one to the F, and hence no projection is needed. Again, we can do the jordan Wigner transformation and we land on this operator. Recall, this is the one whose quantization could be questioned because we started with an odd number of fermions. And I just say, we just blindly uh, quantize it. And we land on this operator, this Hamiltonian, which had already been written by these authors. And it flows in the infrared to the continuum icing model with a non-invertible defect, uh, D, that I discussed earlier. Now, depending on how much time I have, I can skip other, the other parts or can have one of them or something. When did I start? You have 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, oh, great. So somebody asked me, I think you did, whether this is explicit to the lattice. So let me briefly show an example where the same phenomenon happens in the continuum. Uh, it's a little bit, the mechanism is a little bit different, but there are many similarities. So let's consider the C equals one compact boson, so it's compact, and I use the dual field phi tilde, the condensed matter physical is referred to this model as the Lattinger liquid. And what I call phi tilde is usually denoted by theta. So I do that, I establish the dictionary, wherever you see phi tilde, if you're a condensed matter physicist, think of it as theta. So this is the action. And there's only momentum symmetry, what we call momentum symmetry, the condensed matter physicist called charge. There's only one U1. We don't have the vorticity slash winding symmetry because we broke it explicitly by this story. So for lambda equals zero, we have a one parameter family of conformal field theories at long distances. So we set lambda to zero. So this is the compact boson. This is the BKT point in my normalization of R. And this is the SU2 WZW model. Now let's turn on lambda. We turn on this operator. Then this is the same, op this is the same effective theory of say the XY model studied here in Chicago, uh, long before I got into physics. 
And there, in modern terms, we would say that for R larger than two, this operator is irrelevant, and therefore the model is still gapless. A smaller value of R, this operator is relevant, and therefore this model is gapped. And in between, there is a phase transition that leads to a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I emphasize that the winding symmetry here is not an eminent symmetry, it's an emergent symmetry. And the reason is that this operator is irrelevant here. So if we go to slightly higher energies, we'll see that it is there. So the emergent symmetry is relevant, is violated by irrelevant operators. Now let's add a chemical potential. So there's only one symmetry in the problem, the U1. That, that U1, the symmetry in terms of the original phi, this is the charge. And I'm, but I'm working in terms of the dual field, so it's the winding of that charge. So this is the charge. So I'm going to take this system that has one U1 symmetry, and I'm adding a chemical potential for a, the only U1 symmetry in the problem. Okay, so this is the action. The chemical potential, I put it here, because the cross term gives us a coefficient times the charge. And there's an, an uninteresting, I shouldn't say irrelevant, there's an uninteresting additive constant. Uh, we'll tune little q, so big A, we think of it as big, and we're going to tune q, sorry, big L is the unit of length, and we tune little q to be near an integer. And I'll take this integer to be large, but finite. So this is a system with a chemical potential. And it's easy to analyze it, because what we need to do is perform a change of variables, the phi hat, shifting it by a turn linear in x. And since this q is an integer, this is a valid change of variables. And if I do that, the chemical potential appears only here, only in the second, only in the last term. So for lambda equals zero, you can forget about this term. And this is the same as the original problem. In fact, this is kind of a sanity check because what we performed here, so why is it that with the chemical potential, we get the same answer as without the chemical potential? Uh, this is known as spectral flow. But the change of variables that we performed here the chain of variables is known as a spectral flow. And therefore, we should better land on the same theory. So for lambda equals zero, this is the statement that the compact boson with the chemical potential is exactly the same spectrum as the compact boson without the chemical potential, because they are related by spectral flow. Now let's turn on lambda and see what happens. For lambda equals, for non-zero lambda, this operator might be relevant or might be irrelevant depending on the radius. But either way, if Q is large, it oscillates very rapidly in space. And since it oscillates rapidly in space, if I compute correlation functions of operators with low momentum, the correlation functions vanish. So this operator, regardless of whether the radius is large or small, this operator does not have any effect at low energies. So at low energies, this operator is completely absent. In order to see that this operator is present, what I need to do is perform processes with exponentials for operators with very large momentum. Otherwise, I don't see the, this effect. It sounds crazy because I get a symmetry out of nothing, but that's actually the name of the game with these eminent symmetries. I get an exact symmetry out of nothing. But let me say it in a few more ways. Claim that the winding symmetry of the low energy theory is an eminent symmetry. And it started its life as UV translation. But notice that I'm in the continuum. I, both UV translation and IR translation are both in the continuum. Both are translations, but there are two different notions of what I call translation in this story. Because recall that phi tilde was the boson. This is what's called theta, if my condensed matter physicist is under UV translation, phi tilde does not shift, only X shifts. On, in the IR, we should better use this phi hat, and it differs by, from phi tilde by a term linear in X. So the UV person says, under translation, X is shifted and phi hat is shifted. The IR person says, under translation, 
phi hat is not shifted, but x is shifted under translation. So let's examine various operators. Cosine phi hat might or might not be relevant, but it's not invariant under translation of the UV symmetry. So the UV person would say, this operator doesn't respect the symmetries of the problem and therefore it is absent. The IR person says, yeah, it does reflect, it is invariant under the, it, it is invariant under IR translations and therefore it could be present. It violates Weinig symmetry, but we, it appears that this term is absent because in the Weinig symmetry is therefore free. Now, what about this guy? This operator started its life as cosine phi tilde. It is invariant under the UV translation, but it's not invariant under the IR translation. So the UV person would say, aha, this term can be present. In fact, it is present in the action, but it's not invariant under the translation of the IR theory. And therefore it has these vanishing matrix elements between low energy states. So the same magic that happened in the fermionic problem here occurs in the continuum where we have two different notions of, of translation. One of them is accompanied by a shift of a field and the other does not. And the interplay between them gives a symmetry. So the eminent symmetry is not violated by relevant or irrelevant operators. It's an exact symmetry. It looks like I'm pulling a fast one, but this I think this is actually correct. And in various ways it had appeared in the literature earlier. And I'm going to skip two, two slides because it's a lack of time and go to the summary of the talk. So what did we do? We saw that microscopic translation, we call my color coding, a, for example, lattice translation, but I also gave a continuum example, can lead to an eminent internal symmetry. So lattice symmetry can lead to an in, internal symmetry. Again, I emphasize that's not new, but this way of phrasing it is new. And unlike an emergent symmetry, it's an exact symmetry of the low energy theory. And I define what I mean by low energy theory. It's not violated by relevant or irrelevant operators. Then we discussed the Majorana chain, and there were four versions of the Majorana chain, depending on whether A is even or odd, or whether the fermion have periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions, and led in the continuum to the four different continuum theories in SNS, RR, NSR, and RNS. And in each case, minus one to the F left emanates from the microscopic translation. So the internal symmetry started its life as lattice translation. And when there is an anomaly microscopically between translation and minus one to the F, it's matched in the infrared by an anomaly between minus one to the F left and minus one to the F which is good news because there cannot be any anomaly involving continuum <laughs> translation. Otherwise, we would really have a contradiction. Then we perform the sum over the spin structures on the lattice, very explicitly in terms of different Hilbert spaces and how they are connected. And we started with four fermionic theories, but we ended up with three different bosonic models, Ising, twisted Ising, and the Ising with the D defect. The fact that we landed here on our feet fact, we landed on a model that is known is a sign that the way we treated the odd L fermionic problem was not completely crazy. So these lattice models flow to three continuum icing models. Two of them are obvious, icing and twisted icing, depending on whether boundary conditions are periodic or anti-periodic. And the third one, Close in the continuum to a duality to Isaac with the not with the defect of the non-invertible symmetry that emanates from D. Then we saw that we consider the system in the continuum. This was another example. We showed that if we take a system with a U1 symmetry, it has an it has an F any chemical potential, it has an eminent symmetry. There's actually a more abstract way of saying it involving anomalies. There's some anomalies involving translation. I didn't do it here. But some, the fact that something like that must be present actually follows from some kind of an anomaly in the UV theory. I didn't do it here. And this is something I did not do. The various lattice spin models, including the Heisenberg chain, lead to a Z2 eminent symmetry. 
And in various examples, anomalies involving lattice translations are matching the infrared by anomalies involving the internal the eminent symmetry. Otherwise, we would have a contradiction because there are no anomalies involving continuum translation, but there are anomalies involving lattice translation. And I presented this example in my Rana chain. The example I did in the continuum is actually closely related to the various feeling constraints which I did not discuss from that perspective, but that you can read in the paper. And lipschutz matrix theorem is also picked into this picture as lattice translation and an anomaly, is an anomaly between lattice translation and an internal symmetry, which is matching the infrared between an anomaly between an eminent internal symmetry and an ordinary internal symmetry. I'll stop here, thank you. Action. Yeah. yeah um, what do you explain how the duality defect in the icing model is an eminent symmetry arising from the lattice? What degree is it known to be true, or do you expect it to be true that that generalizes to other minimal models, rational conformal field theories in general, or all of these non invertible things you think will be, could be understood? Uh, as eminent in this sense. Okay, so in the continuum, this has been discussed by various people, including Clay. Clay and his crowd that I can't keep track of reading work in this. Uh, no, but I mean but this relation between the lattice. And the relation to, between the lattice and that has been these people started exploring mapping it in the same way we did here for icing. Uh, I know that some people I saw drafts of people started doing it. It's getting considerably more complicated already for tricritical icing. Uh, basically, the idea there is to use, say, parafermions instead of fermions. So the thing here is that we were very lucky. Instead of studying the icing model with all its intricacies, we took a free theory, which is the fermion, analyze it to the end, keeping track of the boundary. The key point is to keep track of the boundary conditions. And the fact that L is finite and being very careful about not work up to surface terms or not work only locally, but keep track of the global features. And I think you are not the person that should really preach that too. Uh, the analog of that for the other minimal models is, for example, to use power fermion. But power fermions, unlike fermions, are not real fields. Uh, so you can do that, but you have that part, the analog of what we did for the fermion takes a lot more work. And I saw a draft with people do that. I do not know if it's correct or not. I will not be surprised if this can be done more generally. In the continuum, there is a way of writing a fermionic version for every minimal model. This was analyzed by Tachikawa and others. So for every minimal model, there is some Z2 symmetry. And just as icing is not exactly the same as the Majorana fermion, Majorana fermion is a fermionic theory. It needs a choice of spin structure. Ising does not. There's a similar story for the other minimal models. And this was worked out in a lot of detail by Tachikawa and others. And I do not know whether people have done the analogous thing on the lattice. I believe it is. it can be done already on the lattice. But yeah, that, that's a little bit harder. Now, you can generalize it in many other directions because essentially the same story appears in higher dimensions, when whenever they whenever there is a duality defect, instead of duality, you could ask, has this duality started its life as an internal symmetry in another? What, what happened here is the duality of icing started its life as minus one to the f left on the fermionic side, and minus one to the f left m is is non-trivial because it emanates from from translation. So in the continuum, there was a minus one to the f left, and that became the duality. On the lattice, there's no minus one to the F left, and that's why you needed to work a little bit For the other minimal models, it's it's more involved. I do not know more general. You don't have some kind of conceptual re moral reason why you think this should, this point of view should always be true. My moral unsubstantiated, moral is always the thing that is unsubstantiated, is that it should work, and I think it would be interesting to work out the details. That, that's my sense. It has not yet been worked out in a satisfactory way. But it's completely clear what needs to be done, right? It, it, especially, you know, in general, in 
in physics when you do research, it helps to know the answer. So we know the answer in the continuum. So we just have to figure out how to see it on the lattice. And it might be that on the lattice, it is true only for a subset of the lattice constants. So another, let me say it in a different way. In the fermionic problem, we automatically landed on the gapless theory. We didn't have to fine tune anything. Lattice translation guaranteed that we would land on the, or the gapless theory, right, at the critical point. There are operators that violate lattice translation, and they indeed take us away from the critical problem. In the Isaac model, that's not the case. So you could ask, why is it that I took this critical Isaac model? Why did I land on the critical point? And the reason I landed on the critical point is that I imposed that non-invertible symmetry. That's not the historical way it was done. The model is exactly solvable, for example, by going to the fermions. But from the way I presented it here, I could change the relative coefficient between the two terms. The two terms in the transverse field I see model, I could change the relative coefficient, and then it will no longer be critical. Which symmetry is violated? So normally we would say there's no symmetry that, that tunes to that point. And therefore, they, I did fine tuning for the two coefficients to be matched the way I wrote them. Am I talking to myself or? There's just one person in the audience. I'm paying attention. Ah, no, I know that you're paying attention. The question is whether it's useful that you pay attention. <laughs> so I'll start again. In the fermionic problem, I impose lattice translation, and that makes sure that I land on the gapless theory. The, in the Ising model, I, I started from the fermions, I went to the Ising, but I would say that, oh, I tuned the relative coefficient between the two terms in the Ising Hamiltonian mm -hmm. and landed on the gap or at the critical point. So now I would ask, is that, does this constitute fine tuning or not in the sense of the tool? Is there a symmetry, is there a special symmetry at that point? And the answer is, yes, there is. It's the non-invertible symmetry. And that's clearly the case in the continuum in Ising, but now it's also clear in, on the lattice. On the lattice, the non-invertible symmetry, there are two terms, x, x, and z. Some people write it as z, z, and x. And what the non-invertible symmetry does is to swap them. So by imposing this non-invertible symmetry on the lattice, we automatically wear at the critical point. Now, how did we impose that symmetry? We imposed it by going to the fermions where this symmetry started its life as lattice translation. So things make sense. So right, if, you, if you just think of the non-invertible symmetry, either was on it. Now, I would guess something like that exists for all the minimum models. Something that will put you automatically at the critical point. Does this um, formalism have uh, any interesting or useful applications for non-abelian, non-asymmetric orbital fields? Ah, it's fascinating. I wish I knew the answer because the quick answer is so far no. And the more detailed answer is that it smells like it should be. But there's a way to think about them as non invertible in the non abelian case. I think you meant asymmetric. I meant asymmetric. Asymmetric, asymmetric, but, asymmetric but you can consider non abelian, in which case I think you can think of them as. Well, the non abelian is a whole set of other questions. But I think what. Because you need the non invertible symmetry. Yeah, but it's non invertible, not in the sense that it's non abelian. It's still abelian. But, but it's not invertible in the sense that there's no inverse. It's not a group. Right. What, what happens in the, in the asymmetric overfold is that you treat differently the left movers and the right movers. Now, he, on the lattice, you don't have separation between the left movers and the right movers. But here we kind of got it out of the two ends of the dispersion relation. So the question is whether you can do that and somehow start from that and treat differently the left movers and the right movers. The quick answer is that I don't know. It would be fascinating if we could do that. that for example, all sorts of anomaly, consist consistency conditions of anomalies should be automatically satisfied. They just should reflect something deep on the lattice. Right? It should not be satisfied by accident. It should be something deep in short distances. So I think it would be nice to work it out. Well, maybe if you take 8K copies of this system, then you have some new possibilities. I think you need okay. mod 8. You need okay, so on the lattice, you don't need the mod 8. So no. when you, you okay, I, I got the corner here. 
And with these people in the audience, I cannot cut corners. I presented, the way I presented the anomaly here, I had only mod two anomalies. I did not have the mod eight. The, there was a mod two in the Ramon Ramon thing where I got a minus sign, so that's a mod two anomaly. And even the one sixteenth that I got, Strictly speaking, it's only mod eight. It's not mod six. It's only mod two. It's not mod eight. When I got the one over sixty, the the symmetry. If you go through the group theory of the eminent symmetry, it started from Z L on the lattice. That was the symmetry as a group symmetry that shifts on by one side, and you should really think of it as a quotient of Z. Uh, in the continuum, the eminent symmetry is Z two rather than Z or Z L. And any anomaly that involves the fact that this is Z2 rather than Z cannot be seen on the lattice. So the eminent symmetry is a quotient of what the symmetry was on the, in the, on the lattice. And therefore it can exhibit more anomalies than the lattice the symmetry can exhibit. So when you try to match continuum anomalies on the lattice with anomalies in the continuum, the match is not Quite so, so every anomaly on the on the lattice could match to an anomaly in the continuum, but there could be more anomalies in the continuum which do not correspond to anything on the lattice. So the mod eight in particular, we wasted several months looking for the mod eight on the lattice, and I think it's not there. But the mod two is there. There's no other question. That's um, thanks, not your So there are some comments about the Heisenberg chain as well. Yes. They, they're in your paper. Yeah, I am happy to give you my Google slides here. On the yeah, if you don't mind mentioning a bit about them. If you don't mind mentioning a bit about yeah. them. Very useful. Yeah, we have to give you now the slides. Yeah. 